All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, all you magnificent melon heads, and happy Monday, everybody. I hope you guys are well. Today is March 25th, 2024, and you may have noticed I'm on the road today. We are uh, traveling with family today, so we're going to be doing this from the hotel, which means grainy picture on the laptop. Sound is a little off. I apologize for that. Uh, also, guys, there was a solar flare last night. Uh, shout out to my moderator, Mish, who picked that one up. So uh, we've got things like grainy camera images. The Wi-Fi is not working all that well. Cell connections are a little weak. So I hope we don't have tech issues again this morning. But we're going to get through this anyway because there's a good amount of stuff going on this morning. Uh, first things first, it just hit the tape a few moments ago. Mish caught it within like 10 seconds. My, my mod is all over things this morning. Uh, Boeing CEO David Calhoun is going to step down at the end of this year. That's an interesting timeline that at the end of the year, he's going to stick around for a little while. Uh, nothing too surprising there. David Calhoun was bought in for Boeing at, in 2020, and that was following two very high-profile crashes in 2019 of the 737 MAX 9 that killed hundreds of people. He was bought in for the sole purpose of writing the ship, of, of revamping the safety culture at Boeing. And, well, empirical data would suggest he's done kind of a do-do job of that, hasn't he? Especially considering, you know, talk of the FAA auditors are saying that they're not getting cooperation. Security footage is disappearing for vital maintenance work involving that Alaska Airlines panel that blew out. And, of course, the whole thing about whistleblowers winding up dead suspiciously, that story went away awful fast, didn't it? That that Boeing whistleblower who wound up dead of an apparently self-inflicted gunshot wound right before he was scheduled to make depositions about Boeing safety culture and violations and being retaliated against for raising safety concerns. By the way, family friends of his said that he told them if he dies, it's not a suicide. Uh, so very suspicious happenings going on at Boeing, to say the least. I'm not surprised to see David Calhoun stepping down. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know what they're waiting for, waiting until the end of the year. Uh, it's just Maybe we'll just move up that timetable a little bit. I just throw them out there. You guys do what you want. But Boeing stock is active, actually reacting favorably to this news this morning. We've also got news out of China here. Um, they are implementing, I don't, I don't know if a chip ban is the right word to use here, but it's further restrictions on U.S. made chips. Um, they announced, or Bloomberg is reporting that China is said to be in the works of implementing a, a phase out restrictions on what was limits on the use of man of U.S. made microprocessors and servers. So that was the actual phrase in the Bloomberg article. Specifically, Intel and advanced micro devices were named. Both of those stocks are not doing so well this morning. The back and forth, the chip wars between the U.S. and China continues. That is uh, no, no signs of slowing in that. We've got Japan's vice finance minister has announced that he is very suspicious of some recent moves in the yen. Um, I don't know why he's suspicious. The PBOC came out with a weak sauce, 10 basis point rate hike from negative 0.1 to zero interest rate. Not much of a rate hike after decades of negative interest rate policy and ultra dovish monetary policy from the PBOC. So I guess he shouldn't be too surprised to see that weakness in the yen. Um, I certainly was. Well, yeah, no, I wasn't surprised to see that weakness in the end because it was. A, I was surprised at how small the rate hike was. Ten basis points is nothing. Uh, we've also got China is intervening in their current currency market, uh, messing with the value of the yuan. China's got enough problems with their stock market and their housing collapse going on, so the PBOC is intervening to try to keep the yuan stable. Uh, we've got more antitrust actions against big U.S. tech firms. Uh, the European Union is really targeting U.S. tech here, and this one could be a big one, possibly 10 percent of revenues. Um, some pretty surprising language going on out of out of Europe here in this targeting of big U.S. tech. So, uh, you know, why don't we just shrink my big melon of a head and let's see what's going on in the markets this morning, shall we? And guys, while we're doing that, don't forget that like button. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm. And if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. We usually have better picture and sound, and we do this every morning. So have your coffee with the melon heads. Now, first things first, 
on my weekly wrap up live stream on Friday last week. I got a super chat from, I believe it was Raiden 57. Uh, thank you, Raiden, again for that super chat. He was asking about the auditing issues that Evergrande was having, and specifically Pricewaterhouse Cooper, who was the auditor of Evergrande. Uh, is under the spotlight because Evergrande inflated their earnings in 2019 and 2020 by something like $78 billion, which would make it the largest accounting fraud in history. And PricewaterhouseCooper signed off on their books. And Raiden was asking about Country Garden's auditor because Country Garden, formerly the largest developer in China, even bigger than Evergrande, well, they're also having trouble with their bonds. And so Raiden was asking who was the auditor at Country Garden. I did not have an answer for him. So I did my homework over the weekend and I have found out this is Country Garden's annual report from 2022. And if you go all the way down to page 120 of the PDF document, you get to their auditor's report. And here we go, guys. I don't know if you can see the print on screen there, but the independent auditor's report is brought to you by none other than... Price Waterhouse Cooper, this same company that signed off on Evergrande's fraudulent books in 2019 and 2020. So Raiden 57, shout out to you, brother. That was an awesome question. And the answer is what you were alluding to, I suspect, that Price Waterhouse Cooper was the same auditor for both firms. Take from that what you will. It doesn't automatically mean Country Garden's books were cooked, but it does mean that the company that didn't catch Evergrande's cooked books is the same company that was looking into Country Gardens. Good question, sir, and thank you again for that super chat. Now let's get through markets and see what's going on today. We've got the S&P 500 is down 16 points ahead of the opening bell, about 0.3% lower. A little bit of negativity in stocks this morning. We've got the Dow is down about 60 points or 0.15% lower this morning. And the NASDAQ is, I'm not saying sharply lower, but it's the NASDAQ is leading the way lower, down more than both the other two indexes, 105 points to the downside or about 0.58% lower ahead of the opening bell for NASDAQ. That is probably being influenced by this antitrust news coming out of Europe and also by the potential of chip bans from China affecting some semiconductors. So it looks like a rough day so far for the NASDAQ. The U.S. dollar is a little bit stronger this morning, up 24 basis points to 104.24. That's about a quarter of a percent higher. That's also going to put some downward pressure on stocks as the stronger dollar means downward pressure on stock prices. And yields, it looks like no big moves in yields this morning, but they are higher mostly across the board here. The 30-year Treasury is yielding 4.405. That's up about a point point three. Uh, the 10-year yield, 4.228. That's up about one point. The two-year Treasury yielding 4.610. That's also up one basis point. And the one month is at 5.382, up about one and a half points this morning. Looking over at commodities this morning, it looks like gold is having a good day despite those higher rates and that stronger dollar. Gold is up 15 bucks this morning, $2,175 for April gold futures, up about 0.7%. And silver's getting in on the action too. May silver futures are at 24.90. That's up about six cents or a quarter of a percent. So not big moves for precious metals here, but considering what the dollar and what interest rates are doing, that's a pretty good day for gold and silver. We've got platinum is up a percent and a half. Palladium is up two and a half percent. And West Texas Intermediate crude oil is up also with May futures at $81.03. That's up 40 cents this morning or about a half of 1% higher. And looking over at Bitcoin, we've got Bitcoins down again, although it looked like it had a pretty good weekend. Uh, notably, you don't have any ETF outflows during the weekend because the markets are closed. So absent the ETF outflows, Bitcoin did pretty good for the last couple of days, currently trading 67,127 as quoted on Coinbase. Although he got a little bit of a red candle today, down about 71, 72 bucks. But we'll see what those if the ETF outflows continues to drag Bitcoin lower this week, or have we finally, uh, has the chart settled down? We had that big surge in ETF inflows after the initial approval. Now we've had about a week and a half, two weeks of outflows. At some point, the ETF is going to settle in and we're going to have some kind of a, an expected noise in the chart and we can get back to normal trading, whatever that looks like in crypto. But for now, the ETFs are still steering the steering the train there. Uh, but this is the main story this morning. Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun to step down. Again, this one was just announced a few minutes ago. 
Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun will step down at the end of the year. The company announced on Monday Calhoun's departure comes as the plane maker has dealt with a raft of production and quality control issues this year, most notably when one of the 737 MAX 9 planes flown by Alaskan Air lost a panel in mid-flight back in January. Last week, Boeing CEO Brian West said the company would see cash outflows of up to $4.5 billion during the current quarter as it works to shore up its production lines. Boeing stock rose as much as 2.5% following the news, though Friday's through Friday's close, the stock had lost more than 27% this year. The company also announced Monday that Larry Kellner, chairman of its board, will not stand for re-election as the company's upcoming annual shareholder meeting. Stephen Mollenkopf, the former CEO of Qualcomm and a Boeing board member since 2022, will replace Kellner and lead the company's search for its next CEO. Boeing also said Stan Deal, currently it's CEO, the CEO of its commercial airplane segment, that he's going to retire. Uh, so a lot of shakeup going on with Boeing's leadership, probably not the last one we're going to see. In a letter to employees on Monday, Calhoun said the Alaskan Air incident was a watershed moment for Boeing. So it was also a plane panel shedding moment for Boeing. They didn't shed water. They shed a piece of the freaking plane mid-flight. The eyes of the world are on us, Calhoun added. And I know we will come through this moment, a better company, building on all the learnings we accumulated as we worked together to rebuild Boeing over the last number of years. And this is some pretty magnificent quarter speak or, or, or corporate speak here uh, when, when they talk about this. I mean, look, look, I'm stepping down because I know I'm about to get fired because I've done such a lousy job. And I love how they positively spin this. They're like, this is a wonderful opportunity for our company. We're going to come out of this great. No, your company kind of sucks right now, Dave, and you got to go because you got to go. You have not done your job. You were bought in to fix the safety problems at Boeing, and they've only gotten worse under your leadership. So you got to go. This is not a great opportunity. This is not going to be a good thing for the company. This is embarrassing. But that's corporate speak for you. What can I say? Calhoun was named Boeing CEO back in January of 2020 as the company grappled with repercussions following the crash of two 737 MAX jets a Lion Air flight in October 2018, and an Ethiopian Air flight in March of 2019. Those crashes together resulted in the deaths of 346 people. In his letter, Calhoun said he's been weighing the decision to step down for some time. So a lot of shakeup, not just the CEO going going away. We've got uh, the chairman of the board is stepping down. We've got uh, another, what was it, the CEO of the commercial planes di division, He's going to be retiring, so probably going to be more announcements of leadership shakeups coming from Boeing in the weeks ahead. Boeing stock this morning is up 3.8%, trading at $196.11. Uh, likes this news. Apparently, shareholders pretty much knew that this was coming. It was largely expected, and so they're reacting positively here. Also going on this morning, we've got Intel and AMD fall on a report that China to limit the use of foreign chips. Intel and advanced micro devices share, shares fell in pre-market trading on Monday after a report that China has adopted new guidance to limit the use of U.S.-made microprocessors and servers in government computers. So, again, I just want to emphasize the language here. This is a report. This is, of course, anonymously support, uh, sourced, as everything coming out of China usually is. Uh, they're not saying an outright ban. They're saying they're going to limit the use. They're saying this is new guidance to limit the use in government computers. So not an outright ban, but it looks like it's another step in that direction. Intel was down 4.1% and AMD slipped 3.2% in early trading before markets opened in New York. The new rules mean that chips made by the companies will be gradually replaced with local alternatives, the Financial Times reported on Sunday citing guidelines unveiled by the Finance Ministry and the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology on December 26th. So I want to emphasize there that the chips from these companies will be gradually replaced with local alternatives. This is not going to be a big sudden shock, at least not based on the wording that Bloomberg is using here. Software provided by U.S. companies, including Microsoft, are also set to be replaced, the Financial Times said. Still, for now, there remains some flexibility for government agencies and state-owned enterprises to buy computers powered by foreign processors servers. The, news, the newspaper reported citing two unnamed procurement officials. So there again, it's a little bit of soft language here that there is still some flexibility and some government agencies can still buy U.S. manufactured microprocessors and servers. 
So, you know, they're putting pressure to limit the use of U.S. tech. They're stopping short of an outright ban here. Um, it, it's hard to quantify the effect on these companies when you have wishy-washy language like that. But at least right now, the market is choosing to be conservative here, and they're assuming the worst because we've got AMD is down 3.5% ahead of the opening bell this morning, trading at 173.30, down about $6.20. And we've also got Intel is down about 3.85% this morning, trading at $40.92. That's down $1.65. So both stocks are taking a hit here. Not catastrophic, but certainly not good news for these companies. Also going on this morning, we've got more antitrust problems for Apple in particular, because the U.S. and Apple have uh, the U.S. and Europe have been all over Apple this year, and now it looks like they're targeting Meta and Alphabet. Also, we got this one in the Wall Street Journal and Barrons this morning. Apple, Meta, and Alphabet probed under new EU law where fines can top ten percent of revenue. And guys, we're talking about the mega cap tech companies here. Ten percent of revenue is tens of billions of dollars potentially in fines here i don't know if this is all talk or if there's no chance they ever do this or uh, but the numbers here could potentially be massive if this ends up being a thing here apple meta platforms and alphabet are being scrutinized by the european union under a new law that can see anti-competitive behavior met with fines of 10 percent of global revenue it's the latest salvo against big tech as global regulatory pressures build. The European Commission, the executive wing of the European Union, opened non-compliance investigations against Apple, Meta, and Alphabet on Monday under the Digital Markets Act, which was first introduced in late 2020. The act went into effect earlier this month and represents the EU's landmark push on tech competition. Investigations specifically target whether Apple and Alphabet steer customers on the App Store and Google Play as well as Meta's pay or consent model, the commission said. We suspect that the suggested solutions put forward by the three companies do not fully comply with the DMA. That's according to Margaret Vestager, the head of competition policy for the European Commission, who said that in a statement. We will now investigate the company's compliance with the DMA to ensure open and contestable digital markets in Europe. Breaches under the Digital Markets Act can be met with fines of up to 10% of global revenue for the company in question, making the stakes tens of billions of dollars. So this could be a very big deal for Apple, for Meta, Facebook, and Alphabet, Google. Uh, just the latest in a long line of antitrust moves on both sides of the Atlantic against big tech. So I don't know if there's actually going to be any fines here. They've just announced that they are beginning the investigation. These things can take a long time to play out. So I wouldn't expect any big moves in these companies, at least not in the near term. Government bureaucrats usually take their sweet time when they do things like this. Moving on to the Forex market, we got some news out of Japan this morning. Japan's FX czar says speculation is behind the weak yen and that he's ready to take action. Yeah, it's definitely speculation. It certainly has nothing to do with 16 years of negative interest rates and decades of near zero interest rates and the most dovish monetary policy since Weimar Germany, right? It certainly has nothing to do with that. That wouldn't be why your currency is weakening. No, it's speculation. You know, kind of like uh, Richard Nixon said it was speculation, right? Remember Richard Nixon said, the United States must defend the dollar against the speculators. And that's why he took us off temporarily took us off the gold standard back in 1971, right? It was all because of the speculators. It certainly wasn't anything to do with money printing and creating asset bubbles and stealing wealth from the middle class and driving people below the poverty line to explode the wealth gap in this country. No, it was about defending from against the speculators. Sure. Speculators made out like champs in those in that deal. Japan's top currency diplomat on Monday warned against speculators trying to sell off the yen saying its weakness did not reflect fundamentals in the latest warning about the currency's big slide against the dollar. Masato Kanda, the vice minister, the vice finance minister for international affairs, made the comment at an ad hoc news conference as the Japanese currency hovered close to a 32-year low, near 152 yen to the dollar. Looking at currencies, the dollar-yen pair has gone through big fluctuations of 4% over only the past two weeks, Kanda reported. Well, yeah, your central bank just changed 
monetary policy, a longstanding policy, you're going to have volatility when that happens. It has not reflected fundamentals, and I feel something is strange about it. Kanda described the recent yen moves as speculative. He said he wouldn't rule out any measures, but stands ready to respond appropriately to the currency's move. He added that he has been closely watching currency moves with a sense of urgency, even when he was traveling overseas over the weekend. Well, those are strong words. I have been closely watching with a sense of urgency. Oh, no, Kanda, please don't use urgency when closely monitoring, i.e. doing nothing about something, please. <laughs> this is this is also, you know, we were talking about corporate speak earlier in the stream. Now let's talk about political speak. When a politician intends to do nothing about a thing, he'll say that he is closely monitoring the situation and that he's engaging with our partners and all kinds of stuff like that, which means I'm not going to do anything about this. He's closely monitoring with a sense of urgency. Whoa, wow. Big, slow down, buddy. No need to throw a grenade in the room here. Jeez. Anyways, the Japanese yen here is at 151.16 Japanese yen to the dollar. Uh, now, guys, I just want to point out, let's zoom out on this chart here. When you see this chart moving higher, that is the yen weakening against the dollar. It takes more yen to make a dollar. And that red line across the top, that represents the all-time low in the yen against the U.S. dollar. And we are not far off of that right now. And look, this is, this is the market's reaction to that weak sauce tightening move by the Bank of Japan. It just moves straight up. That is the yen going straight down versus the dollar because they only raised 10 basis points. That was that was a weak interest rate hike. That's why the yen is weakening. It's not speculators. Anyway, since that statement was made by the vice foreign finance minister for international affairs or whatever his long-winded title is, we got two little red candles here from the Japanese yen. So it, it has strengthened a little bit on those comments. Basically, a government finance minister threatening to intervene in Forex markets will cause a momentary strengthening in the currency, but it hasn't been a very big one here. And we've also got the Chinese are getting in on the currency action this morning. The yuan rebounds as the People's Bank of China sends a strong message of support via fixing. Fixing is seen as a signal that the People's Bank of China doesn't want further yuan weakness. China's yuan paired losses seen Friday after the central bank signaled its support for the managed currency via a stronger than expected daily reference rate. The People's Bank of China set the yuan fixing rate at 7.0996 per dollar on Monday versus 7.2222 as forecast by analysts in a Bloomberg survey. The largest strengthening bias since November, the fixing was set at 7.1004 in the previous session. Today's fixing is a clear signal from the authorities that they do not intend to allow further weakening in the yuan, said Kun Go, head of Asia Research at Australia and New Zealand's banking group. Last Friday's moves were an overreaction by the market, and today's fixing is firmly aimed at correcting that perception. The Chinese are fighting with a stock market volatility problem. They're fighting with the collapse of their real estate market and their bond market is having big problems because of the developers. See also the earlier comments about Country Garden and Evergrande. And so they don't want to add a currency collapse to that problem. So they're intervening to try to fix the yuan. Again, here we're looking at the USD to yuan chart here. When you see this chart moving up, that is the yuan weakening. When you see this chart moving down, that is the yuan strengthening. And we've got a little bit of yuan strengthening this morning here, reversing. It looks like about half of the losses from Friday, currently at 7.2096 to make $1. And the last one I want to talk about this morning, guys, is this story. Now, this one happened mid last week, and I talked about it briefly in my video I did about Martin Shkreli over the weekend. Uh, but this is an important topic, and, and I want to mention this one here. I don't know how big of a story this really is. This is either a nothing burger on the way to bigger and better earnings from the, the chip makers and the AI mania, or this could be the first sign of weakness among the end users and the customers of these GPUs. And that's why I want to draw attention to this. Uh, last week, Microsoft basically gobbled up Inflection AI. Now, Inflection AI is one of your second tier AI platforms. They're not one of the big giants like Amazon, uh, you know, AWS or Microsoft or, or Meta and Google, right? Inflection AI was kind of along the, one of your, your mid-level AI programs. They were, had a lot of chat bots. And everything. Apparently things at Inflection AI weren't going so well. And Microsoft stepped in last week and they didn't buy the company. They just hired all the talent. 
Microsoft hired two out of the three founders of Inflection AI last week, and most of the employees, we don't know how many, but they basically just hired up the whole company. And now whatever's left at Inflection AI is basically just going to coast down. The, the company's gotten as big as it's ever going to get. This is another one of those companies that NVIDIA took a stake in and you know, Microsoft actually owned a stake in this company too, but it looks like they're pretty much, they're still in business, but not for much longer. They were using phrases like make investors whole at Inflection AI. That's a notable shift in the language from we're all going to be freaking rich because AI is going to be a quadrillion dollar industry to we're going to make our investors whole. That sounds a little more desperate. Like, don't worry, you're going to get your money back, I swear. Uh, Microsoft will pay Inflection AI $650 million. Basically, that's uh, bribe money, like don't sue us. You can't sue us. We'll give. We'll write you this big check. It's enough for you to pay back half of your investors. And then, you know, you're basically waiving any legal rights. Uh, Inflection is also moving to some low. Now, this is the big thing here. This is what I wanted to talk about, this byline. Inflection is also moving to offload some of its computing capacity as it moves forward. Now, that statement is important there. They're offloading computing capacity. So this is kind of a test for the AI market. I suspect there is no shortage of companies that are going to step up and buy up this computing capacity. All right. Based on all the language, all these AI bros have been using about how desperate the market is for more compute. We don't have enough compute. We know we need so many of these things. And look, NVIDIA's numbers, at least so far, back that up. So there should be no problem with some other company coming in and buying up this compute capacity. But there's an important thing I wanted to note all the way down, about three quarters of the way down this article. Where was it? I, I got to do a control F here. There we go. It was this sentence down near the last, or about halfway down the, the, the article here. The company is seeking a partial refund from its cloud computing partner, CoreWeave, one of the people said, and that is the line right there. You see, CoreWeave went out and bought, I believe it was something like 20,000 of the NVIDIA H100 GPUs, which, you know, off the top of my head, math is probably something like $700 million, maybe $650 million worth of these NVIDIA GPUs that CoreWeave went out and bought for the purpose of renting them to Inflection AI. And Inflection AI was paying for that with the money that NVIDIA gave them. See, also round tripping, guys, all right? We have that money eventually ends up right back in NVIDIA. But the point is now Inflection AI wants their money back, all right? So at the very least, this story of the insatiable appetite for computing capacity is a little bit lessened here from this story. I don't know if this is the start of a trend. If more companies are going to come in and say, you know, we don't need our computing capacity either, all I'm saying is that this is the first who spent a lot of money on that computing capacity, and now they're saying we want that money back, All right? It's only one story, does not a trend make, but this is a big one. And when I mentioned this to Pharma bro Martin Shkreli, who was running his mouth on X uh, Friday night, which was hilarious, by the way, um, you know, he's because Corweave is seeking a $16 billion valuation. And I said, hey, Pharma bro, number one, you're a fraud. And number two, um, how come if there's so much demand for these things and it's insatiable, why is this company asking for their money back? Never got an answer from Pharma bro about that one. I did get a whole bunch of BS and back and forth. And to be honest, it was the most fun I've had on a Friday night in a while because, well, I guess I need to get out more. That's probably the lesson there. But I did a video about Pharma Bro. If you want to check that out, I had a little bit of fun with that. Anyways, he's a clown and he's a crook and he's a fraud. And everything he says needs to be viewed through the lens of the fact that he's a convicted fraudster. And therefore, you have to automatically assume everything the man says is a lie. And chances are that's probably the truth. Uh, but he's a proud CoreWeave customer. So there's that. Good, good luck. Ride that rocket, CoreWeave. Uh, Anyways, I just want to say thank you very much to Mr. Dive Bar, who says, would love more talk about it. Platinum, given it is at nearly 15-year lows and 30 times more rare than gold with far more use cases. Seems like a sleeper. Thanks. Okay, D Dive Bar. Uh, look, Platinum, maybe it does have a lot of use cases, but right now the biggest use case of Platinum is automotive. There are others. It is used in jewelry. It is used in certain electronics applications. But the lion's share of Platinum's use is in catalytic converters. The same goes for palladium. And therefore, platinum and palladium will follow the auto market at least partially, probably in a majority manner, 
for the foreseeable future. And so, I mean, it's basically a proxy for auto sales. I, I know it's not like for, you know, one for one, it doesn't track exactly. Um, but the auto market is in trouble right now. And so platinum, I'm not surprised to see it at 30 year lows, but the rarity is a thing. It, it's a very illiquid market. And I would say the biggest upside potential for something like platinum is the fact that almost all of the platinum supply is controlled by BRICS countries. You've got South Africa is by far the largest producer and the second largest producer is Russia. So besides automotive exposure, the biggest risk, or I should say the biggest upside to platinum is if things between the US and BRICS ever got so bad that there was anything resembling an embargo, then that would send platinum prices in the US skyrocketing. But at the same time, that would be shooting themselves in the foot because, well, the US is the biggest auto market in the world. China may be getting close, but for now, I'm pretty sure it's the US. And well, if you refuse to sell platinum to the biggest auto market in the world, you just destroyed the, your own market for platinum. Uh, so I touch on it every morning, but it's not something that I hyper focus on or, or, or divert that much resources to it. But I do appreciate the super chat. And by the way, um, I want to send a shout out to my buddy, Jesse Day over at Commodity Culture. He's actually did a fantastic documentary about platinum, uh, Little Silver. It was about a year ago he did that. That's a very good video. I highly recommend that. And shout out to my buddy, Jesse, over at Commodity Culture. And thank you, Jana Williams, for the super sticker. I appreciate that very much. Thank you for supporting the channel. And thank you to HP Lovecraft, says Panera Bread ordering and loyalty app out system-wide. Most likely ransomware because of radio silence from the company. PBIPO second time in 2024. What is P oh Panera Bread? They're IPOing again. Really? I didn't know. I didn't know Panera was IPOing. Um, when I hear Panera Bread, I immediately think of that BS in California with the minimum wage law and how they carved themselves out an exemption to that. What a joke that was. Uh, look, I'm not too surprised to see some tech issues this morning. Um, I was having a hell of a time getting ready for this live stream this morning. I don't know if it was that solar flare was creating problems, but I, I was having a hard time getting the Wi-Fi to work. I was trying to use my hotspot, getting that to work. I finally was able to limp through this one. Um, but tech issues today are probably going to be a thing. And by the way, I hear you may be able to see the northern lights tonight as far south as Alabama. I don't know how true that is, but that would be something. So uh, keep an eye on the sky this morning. You might get a show. And uh, thank you for that information about Panera Bread, uh, because besides tech issues being widespread, hacks are going crazy right now. There is a cyber war that's being fought in this world right now. And, you know, doctor's offices and medical outfits are still struggling with that change health hack that is still causing problems. Um, so I don't think there's any end in sight to that one, unfortunately. Thank you very much, HP Lovecraft. I appreciate the super chat, support of the channel. And thank you to Cole Marsh. For the Nixon impression, I'm not a crook. Yes, that's Nixon. We must defend the dollar against the speculators. Martin Shkreli is a loser and a liar and a crook, and you shouldn't listen to a single word that he says. Thank you very much, Cole Marsh. I appreciate the super chat and the support of the channel, brother. And thank you, everybody, for having your coffee with the Melonheads this morning. Thank you for all the super chats and the generosity. And thank you to my Patreon supporters for everything you guys do to support the channel and to my magnanimous Melonhead members. I've got links down below to all that good stuff, should you feel so inclined. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I love you guys. Everybody, until next time, live small and dream big.